Hey guys, William Solomon here, Senior Executive of the Pharmaceutical Industry, giving you all the insider tips about what goes on in pharma, healthcare, and everything else. I'm going to cover part two in our series. If you like this video, you like this content, be sure to subscribe, share with your friends, and comment below. I'm always happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, guys. All right, so let's talk about what is R&D in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, R&D stands for Research and Development, and you may not know this, but it takes on average about 10 to 14 years to bring a drug to market, and the cost is staggering. On average, it costs over $2.5 billion, that's with a B, $2.5 billion to bring a drug to market. This is one of the big reasons why drugs are really expensive, because it's a very costly endeavor to bring a drug to market. And on top of that, the chance of success is very small. So only about 12% of drugs that are actually researched and studied at the R&D level make it to commercialization. So it's a very, very difficult endeavor to begin with. So what is the C-suite in the pharmaceutical industry? Just like any other industry, as you probably guessed, the C-suite is your CEO, your CFO, uh, your chief medical officer, CMO as well. Those are all your C-suite folks. And these are the folks that are really making the big strategic decisions. But what I wanted to talk about a little bit was what are some of the characteristics of the people that become eventually the CEO of a major pharmaceutical company? By and large, they come from kind of two different sectors within the pharma company as they move up. One, many times they come through the sales division. So they become maybe vice president of sales or a head of sales, and then they kind of move up the ranks that way to lead the organization. Or oftentimes they have the medical background, or they might be a physician. That's become more and more of a trend recently. And then that's another way in which they move up the ranks to lead a uh, major pharmaceutical company. CEOs, CFOs, CMOs, they're under a lot of scrutiny because there's, of course, as we talked about before in earlier videos, a lot of regulations in the pharmaceutical industry. So they need to make sure that they build strong relationships with regulatory bodies like the Food and Drug Administration. They have to make sure they build relationships on the Hill, on Capitol Hill in Washington, for example, and in general within governments, because they may try to push for different um, legislative uh, laws that are favorable for their industry. And actually in the United States, the trade organization that is very powerful for the pharmaceutical industry is called Pharma, P-H-R-M-A, Pharma, P-H-R-M-A. So what is medical affairs? What is medical affairs? It's actually, like I mentioned in an earlier video, one of the fastest growing areas in the pharmaceutical industry. Medical affairs is responsible for the generation of new information once the drug has been approved and the dissemination or the communication of that information to physicians, to pharmacists, to nurses, to any really group of healthcare providers. And within the medical affairs function, probably the biggest group, subgroup kind of within that function is what we call is field medical affairs or medical science liaisons. So who are medical science liaisons? or we call MSLs. Now, medical science liaisons are people that have an advanced degree, usually uh, an MD degree, a PhD, or they might have a PharmD degree. PharmD means a doctorate of pharmacy. The majority probably have a pharmacy degree, a doctorate of pharmacy degree, or PharmD. And their job is to go out and educate physicians, mostly, who are thought leaders, on the product that their company is trying to sell and on the disease state for that product. Now you might be wondering, wait a second, I thought that sales reps do that. Well, sales reps do do that, but they're really doing it at a very high superficial level. Whereas the medical science liaison or the MSL, they're providing information that's much more in depth, much more uh, delivered in a scientific way or a clinical way. So when they're engaging healthcare providers, they're doing it in a much more kind of peer-to-peer -peer format as if it would be one doctor speaking to another about disease state or about different treatments for a particular disease area. So it's presented in a very different way. It's much more educational versus being salesy. Now the medical affairs function has actually increased by over 300% in the last 10 to 15 years. And so there's a lot more opportunities available for people that have these backgrounds, such as an MD, a pharmacist, or a PhD professional. 
And one of the reasons why they've increased so significantly is that, think about it, more, the more of the drugs that are coming out to market nowadays, they're much more complex. Their mechanism of action is a lot more complex. How they work is much more multi-layered. Um, we also have the advent of biologics and biosimilars, it's something I've talked about in other videos. But these are complex molecules, and as we're learning more and more in science, we're uncovering more in-depth information. So you need people that have that advanced clinical background who can deliver that information to healthcare providers in a meaningful way. So this is one of the reasons why medical affairs has really grown significantly. The other reason is simply that doctors or other healthcare providers prefer to get information from people that have their background, people that are peers like them, uh, versus getting it, let's say, from a sales representative. They, they perceive that as being a lot more credible, which you can see makes a lot of sense.